Hello, welcome to Thor Talk, the show all about Marvel's resident, God of Thunder. On this episode of Thor Talk, in the deepest depths of the earth, Thor confronts his mother. Gaia has unleashed the Elder Gods upon the earth, and they nearly destroyed everyone on it, and Thor would know why. But he is not met by the kind and nurturing Earth Mother. The earth can be much crueler, and as she reveals the truth, it may not be enough to satisfy her son. We'll see what happens as Gaia faces Thor on Thor Talk. I am Thor the Thunderer, son of Odin, prince of Asgard, and this world is under my protection. The Immortal Thor number 8 was written by Al Ewing and was published in March of 2024. The issue begins with a quote from the 19th century poem titled Earth by William Cullen Bryant. Ha, how the murmur deepens. I perceive and tremble at its dreadful import. Earth uplifts a general cry for guilt and wrong, and heaven is listening. Earth is a poem in which the earth is mourning its current state and the state of humanity. William Cullen Bryant was a Puritan, who believed that when man turned away from God, they fell into sin, and at the same time nature became fallen with man. This poem reflects this, with the poet asking the earth if it yearns for the beauty that it once had, in that fair age before the winds became sharp with frost. Nature has become corrupted and less beautiful due to the sins of mankind. In this quote, the earth is crying out over the wrong done to it and its beauty by humanity, whilst God in heaven is listening. The reason this quote was chosen is because Bryant's earth struggles are similar to the ones experienced by Gaia. She too has felt humanity's actions cause great damage to the earth, and she too cries out. Humanity's greed has polluted the planet and has caused great harm to nature. Just as heaven is listening to the earth crying out, Thor, himself a god of the sky, is listening to Gaia's cries. On the coast of Norway, there is a cave. It was here before people, and here, people die. Boats are wrecked, swimmers are dragged under by the current. Those who enter never return. If you do not approach this place with respect, it will kill you. Here, the earth does not have mercy. Here, the earth is cruel. Thor came to this place seeking truth, and though he knew such truth would not be easily heard, there was a moment when the chill of the air gripped his heart. For what boy does not fear his mother's wrath? Yet Thor was no longer a child. He was all father of the Asir now. He was Midgard's Avenger. And to the Odin son, these were not mere titles to be adorned like an ermine cloak. These were vows. Vows to protect that led him into a cathedral of stone that mortals have not seen since the gods were young. Before humanity had words upon their tongues, they huddled by firelight to tell tales of nature's great bounty, and what comes when nature is taken for granted. Thor stands in Gaia's place of power, and he demands a word. And as Thor cried out, his mother answered. Twas natural to hesitate. Thor was god of thunder, a god of the sky. Such a being is not at home when asked to voyage deeper and deeper into the earth. Yet the truth he sought was not found above. Deeper and deeper he ventured, until he beheld Gaia. Yet this was not the Gaia he knew. Right at the beginning, the story is surprisingly ominous. Thor has to confront Gaia for her role in setting the Elder Gods loose, but this doesn't seem like a son confronting his loving mother about a dark secret she may have. It feels like Thor is going into the maw of death itself. This aspect of Gaia is something that Thor really hasn't seen. She's always appeared to him as the kind and nurturing Mother Earth, but now he's faced with the other aspects of the Earth. In Greek mythology, Gaia served as both friend and foe to the gods, which reflects how nature itself can be both nurturing and cruel. Also, I loved the writing from Ewing here, and I did my best to quote it as often as I could. Thor fearing his mother's wrath and feeling out of place into the earth as a sky god, but pressing on. Thor viewing his many titles, not his accomplishments, but his vows. It's all so very good. Gaia tells her son to speak. Thor sees that she is busy, so he will not keep her long. 
His question is a simple one. Why? Tornos was loosed and mortals died, mortals whose lives Thor has sworn to protect. Had Thor not managed to drive him off, Tornos would have killed everyone, including Gaia herself. Tornos called himself the Utgard Thor, so Thor had Loki remind him of his own time in Utgard and what he did to keep the realm sealed. To remind him of how Utgard Loki warned that if the gate to Utgard was unlatched, it would cause everything to fall to catastrophe. Gaia grows impatient and asks if this tale has a point. Indeed it does. As Tornos fled defeated, back to whence he had come, he spoke a name. The name of she who unsealed the gate. And it was your name, mother. So I ask again. Tell me why. Gaia admits that this is a fair question, and she will answer it. But she has a question of her own. Who is he to know her reasons? Who? I am the champion of Midgard, the realm you endangered. I am the avenger of those you have wronged. I am your child. Hmm. I have had many children, she says, and you are least among them. What? <coughs> Thor's passionate plea is met by Gaia's cold rebuke, by the earth laying hands on her own son, by his mother describing the merciless truth that he sought. Mighty Avenger, champion of the earth, where were you when the earth was formed? Tornos was there, Chathan and Set and Tiwaz were there. He who you call Utgard Loki, he whose name we cannot know or speak was there. And I was there as the ancient gods made war. For I was there to win that war. In the last issue, we were teased with an Utgard Odin. And based on his appearance, I guess that he was Buri, also known as Tiwaz. Well, Ewing did not wait long to confirm that, as Gaia just counted Tiwaz... Thor's great-grandfather, as being among the Elder Gods. I'm glad he's not keeping us in suspense, and I'm excited to see Tiwaz show up. Also, it is interesting that Utgard Loki's name is so secret that even his own siblings don't know it. It is a bit jarring to see Gaia so cold and unkind to Thor. They unfortunately haven't interacted very much, but she has always been affectionate when they have. Even if this is just another side of her, I don't think she's being entirely honest here. Most of what she says is just cold, harsh reality. Yes, she has had many children. But Thor should definitely not be considered least among them. Especially since he's probably saved her more than any one of her other children. And, well, he's Thor. Also, I thought Thor's response to Gaia dismissing him was a really powerful moment. He begins with a powerful rage over her actions, and in his final line it becomes more of a desperate plea. This isn't a villain. This is his mother. His mother who can apparently hold Mjolnir with her vines. This could be because the vines fulfill a loophole since they're technically not a person, or since Thor controls the enchantment, he may view his mother as being worthy. We know from Tornos that the worthiness enchantment can work on Elder Gods, so it's probably not just Gaia overpowering it. At the dawn of the earth, Gaia gazed upon the God War, upon the newly born Elder Gods battling each other. Gaia alone among Demiurge's creations shared the Demiurge's desire to create. Demiurge planted the seeds of the gods in the earth. Now she who was the earth pleaded with Demiurge to plant a new seed within her. So the first among Sky Fathers planted a seed into the Earth Mother. She went to the deep places, perhaps to the very place where she now restrains Thor, and there did she give birth to Thor's eldest brother, a tomb, first of that age of gods. The sun he was, and the god of the sun, and he burned away all that was not needed on the Earth. Those ancient elder gods shrieked curses as a tomb tore them from existence, and took their essence into himself and in so doing he showed his other face. The night side when the sun has set, the empty shell that howls through many mouths. Demogorge. Thor reminds Gaia that he has faced him many times. Gaia says that Thor has faced Demogorge, not a tomb, and he should not face a tomb. 
Gaia is half right here. Thor has fought and bested Demogorge before, but he has also sort of faced a tomb in battle. In Thor Annual number 14, Thor goes to the core of the sun to get a tomb's help, but he refuses since doing so will transform him into Demogorge. Thor tries to force him, but his attacks are completely ineffective. However, he manages to cause some harm to him by creating lightning from the essence of the sun. Thor's arrogance and attacks annoys Atum so much that he accidentally turns into Demogorge and the Atum side of the battle ends. However, Gaia was right that Thor should avoid a fight with Atum since he was basically ineffective against him. It's clear that Ewing has more plans for Atum later on and wants to make it clear that he is on a different level. Thor acknowledges his mother's warning but reminds her that the Elder God survived Atum's wrath but Gaia says it was only a scant few. Chathan and Set created nether planes to escape to. Oshtor and Tiwaz wandered and sired their own children, but the one who cannot be named took a different path. Like Chathan and Set, he created his own domain, an outland to escape a tomb and his monstrous gullet, but unlike his siblings, he did not go alone. Gaia heard a rumor from the beak of Tiwaz's servant that Tornos would travel with the Utgard Loki. The nameless elder god says she should not be surprised since despite their disagreements, there is common ground in being hunted by a ravenous god killer. Their strength in numbers. Kemur will join them, and hooded Medjed, and the blood-handed Nurgle. They will build a temple of their own in the Utgard realm, a pantheon, a great hall. And after he builds the gates to this realm, he gives the key to his sister Gaia, in case she would ever wish to unlock it. And now she has. So we finally get an explanation for the Utgard gods. The Utgard Loki took a few elder gods, including Tornos, and created a new pantheon. We get the names of three new gods that are part of this Utgard pantheon. Kemur, Medjed, and Nergal. Kemur is Egyptian for the Black One. It is another name for the Egyptian falcon god, Horus. It was also another name for the Egyptian bull god, Menevis. Given that we know that Horus is active in the Marvel Universe, I'm guessing that Ewing will go with the bull god. Medjed is a minor Egyptian god who is described as a smiter who is unseen. Nergal is a Mesopotamian god of war and the ruler of the underworld. Thor once again pleads with his mother for an answer as to why she unlocked the gate. What reason could she possibly have for turning on her own children? Her response is cold. Ask the dinosaurs. Ask Loss Asheim, which she allowed his father to raise. The earth is not always kind. She has looked upon those who think they own the earth, as if they own her. She sees they will not change unless change is forced upon them, so she will force that change to spare them even worse. It was humanity who summoned the superstorm. She merely took them at their word. We finally find out Gaia's reasons for unleashing the Utgard gods, and honestly I kind of thought this was the reason. It's kind of obvious. Why would the Earth be upset with humanity? Probably the copious amounts of pollution that's destroying the Earth. Gaia's actions are very similar to the ones she took during the God War. The Earth's inhabitants cause so much destruction that life will not be allowed to flourish, so she must remove them. Unlike what she did to the Elder Gods, Gaia seems to view her actions as being for humanity's own good. If humanity is allowed to continue harming the environment, then they will be condemned to a slow, painful death on an uninhabitable world. If humanity will not change, then the Elder Gods will force a change. Plus, it's not like the Earth has never had a reset. Gaia references Asheim, which was the original name of the Earth. Odin's brother Kull ruled it, but after defeating him, Odin wiped out all of the inhabitants of Asheim and renamed it Midgard to ensure that Kull wouldn't rise again. This is one of the reasons I love Ewing's Immortal Thor run. He loves continuity and he does a great job of stitching together lore from previous stories. So this is your justice then? To save the mortals from themselves, you must kill them by the thousands? Is that correct? I have heard such cold rationales before, mother. I did not accept them then. 
and I will not now! Gaia asks if Thor rebels against her judgment. I do, for it is judgment without mercy. If the mortals have a chance to change their fates, they must be allowed to try. And I will defend their right to do so. Even against the Earth itself! Gaia's head rolls off her body, but she is unharmed. Thor cannot fight the Earth itself, and he was wrong. She tells him there is mercy in her judgment. Long before any of this, when I first saw the road humanity would walk, I gave them one hope. I gave them you, Thor. You are my mercy. Here we get a better idea of Gaia's true feelings. Despite her harsh words, Gaia really does care about humanity. That's why she gave them a protector from nature. As Thor revealed in the Immortal Thor number 5, the power of Thor is the power to hold the storm back. He is what stands between humanity and the cruelty of nature. He is Gaia's mercy, and by no means least among her children. Despite the fact that she feels humanity's destruction is inevitable and necessary, she gives them a chance. She gives them Thor. But she will not seal the gate for Thor's sake. Defeating Tornos bought Earth time, but its time still grows short. And if he has a more precise judgment to apply against those who would end the Earth, then he should hurry. So Thor seeks out the selfish member of humanity most responsible for the Earth's pollution, Taylor Swift. <laughs> Just kidding. Thor arrives at Roxxon and demands to speak with Dario Agar, the minotaur whose greed has long bedeviled both him and his mother. Thor spots an elevator that leads to the minotaur's office. The receptionist says that Dario Agar absolutely does not take meetings without a prior appointment. Then he will see me, for I have had an appointment for a meeting with Dario Aga for some considerable time, and it will be our final meeting. I am really curious how Ewing plans on tackling this issue of pollution, because there really isn't a good answer. Ewing can't permanently fix the issue of the destruction of the environment, because doing so would mean the comics no longer reflect our world. Maybe Thor can find a compromise? Maybe Dario Agar is single-handedly responsible for so much pollution that stopping him would be enough to appease Gaia? He's a comic book villain, so it's possible. But regardless, it feels like they are indeed overdue for a meeting. Dario was introduced as a Thor villain and Thor briefly dealt with him in his introduction arc, but they haven't really had much interaction since then. Overall, I felt a real sense of uneasiness reading this issue. It's jarring, and it feels wrong to see Thor's loving and kind mother be so cruel and cold. Yet, that seems to be the point. That nature is multifaceted, and so is Gaia. We are taken aback by this at the same time Thor is. It's not a character assassination or a retcon like we've seen with Thor's other parent. The old Gaia is still there, and we see glimpses of her in the mercy this cruel Gaia offers. I hope that this whole experience brings mother and son closer together in the end. Despite the uneasiness I felt, I think this is among Ewing's best writing for the series, or at least as far as narration and dialogue go. I had to resist not quoting too much, but I still include a lot. Also, I think it's time we address the elephant in the room. Martin Cocalo is not here for this issue. Instead, Ibrahim Robertson is the artist. I love Cocalo's art, and I want as much of it as possible. But with that being said, Robertson did a fantastic job here. If Cocalo needs to take another break, or has to leave the series for some mysterious reason, Robertson could have the job as far as I'm concerned. Overall, it was yet another great entry, and I can't wait to see how Thor's confrontation with the Minotaur plays out. Also, while I have you here, I love helping people who share my passion for Thor. So, if Spanish happens to be your first language, and you want some more Thor content, I recommend checking out a relatively new Thor channel. He's got over 200 videos covering Thor in comics, mythology, and MCU entirely in Spanish. I'll put the link to the channel below.
I've spoken with him, and he seems like a good guy, so I hope you'll give him a watch. Well, that's all for this episode of Thor Talk. Ewing has not only given us another great entry in the series, but gave it to us only two weeks after the last one. The immortal Thor is the gift that keeps on giving. Anyway, with that being said, see you next time on Thor Talk, where... You'll be holding